Hello and welcome to the IdeaCast interview series, episode number 68. And my guest in this episode is Heisha Abrams. Heisha is an attorney and a mediator, as well as author of the book, Holding the Calm. And in this conversation, we talk about the book, Holding the Calm, as well as what Holding the Calm means and what value it can have for mediators and attorneys locked in intense negotiations and discussions and settling uh, disputes. But the book has a power and a utility that goes way beyond mediation and litigation, and it could be of value for everyday persons like myself and for those who discover it. So I invite you to engage with this conversation and uh, as a passive observer, of course, and uh, see if there's any takeaway from you. I found the book very interesting. I, um, I would never bring an author or a book onto, onto my show without uh, finding a value in it that I think would be good, uh, not only for myself, but for the audience that uh, comes to, to listen to these conversations. So enjoy, and I appreciate your company. I appreciate you showing up and, and being, uh, being with us. Thank you so much. I'd like to welcome Heisha Abrams to the IdeaCast interview series. I look forward to having a conversation with her about things that we've all dealt with in our lives and people that we've dealt with in our lives. And Heisha's written a really, written rather, a really neat book um, that I just finished this weekend that's being recorded on a Monday called Holding the Calm. So Heisha, welcome. I'm looking forward to talking to you about your book, Holding the Calm. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. So let's give a little background from you uh, and where you're coming from in writing this book, because I think that'll lend some, some good context to uh, to your authority <laughs> holding the calm. <laughs> you got it. Well, I'm a lawyer and I'm a mediator and I've mediated thousands and thousands of cases from the secret recipe over Pepsi to, you know, Google and Amazon and IBM and behemoths fighting over billions of dollars, you know, to someone getting killed to a political firing, to absolutely everything. And I just thought I have tricks of the trade, as do other professional mediators and negotiators, and these need to be available to everybody. So I thought, why should these be like kept private? You know, I should share some of these things. And some of them are so simple and so easy to do. Just your terminology, how you approach something, how you do something can turn somebody from friend into foe. It doesn't require a master class or a master's degree or some advanced whatever, whatever. It's just understanding some of the basic things about how to move through life, right? So yeah. that's what it's about. Yeah, absolutely. And I like um, that this book can be accessible and um, of utility to persons like myself who aren't involved in litigation or mediation. Um, I can apply it to my interaction with social media or with people that uh, I, my personality may not necessarily uh, land with their personality. So I like that your book has a broad, uh, not just an appeal, but a broad utility to it. Um, even at the end of the book, you have a work uh, list of things that people can do, um, you know, having taken everything away from the reading uh, that they can incorporate into just about any kind of behavior that involves you being right. an interlocutor with somebody else or or just dealing with your family, maybe. <laughs> well, part of the reason I did that is, you know, I was told, no, you should make it a workbook and, you know, publish it separately and charge for it. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that at all. I'm going to give away for free in the back of the book because we learn in groups. That's just how humans learn. So in your office, you don't have a budget for training. Great. You do a self-training. I mean, the book's cheap. It's like, you know, 15 bucks, I think, or 18 bucks on Amazon and wholesale. If you mm -hmm. buy a hundred, you know, mm -hmm. it's 10 bucks each. And then this way you can have people just read and then discuss it with each other. And what happens is you read something and think, oh, I get that. Or, oh, that's stupid. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else say, oh my God, it changed my life. And you go, you're kidding me. Really? Why? How was that impactful for you? And now all of a sudden, it literally becomes a great training. Mm -hmm. And I've done lots and lots of training in my life where people pay me a lot of money. You know, I do speeches to come and to do. And they're great and they're marvelous and they're very inspiring to do that. But if you don't have the budget and you can't do it, mm -hmm. do it with just a small group in your church, in your synagogue, in your mosque, in your homeowners association, at work, even within a family group. Now, all of a sudden, it's an easy, simple thing to practice and play around with some of this stuff and say, you know what? I tried that thing. Hot darn. It worked. Yeah. 
Yeah. And um, without giving too, too much away about the book, um, I like the fact that you coming at it multimodally or multi-aspectually in this idea of holding the calm, which I may get you to define uh, in a, in a moment when I'm done blabbing, but, uh, that you, <laughs> yeah, I have tangent, I have tangent, uh, hey, but you on the microphone <laughs> host prerogative, but I have to humble myself because people will call me out on the comment section. Like you should talk too damn much. And it's like, I need to hold the call. <laughs> and I did that on a comment. Some guy was like, you're talking over your guest. And it, I, I said, okay, I'll take that to heart. I said, but he's been on with me four times for 11 hours of dialogue. He, he, if he wasn't happy, he wouldn't come back for the last three hours or whatever. So anyway, I, uh, tangent on a tangent. Um, but what I love is that it's multi-aspectual and that you are doing um, persuasive speaking. You're doing uh, sense-making when it comes to our basic psychology, excuse me, even neuroscience and neurochemistry. So, uh, you know, for the audience, this has uh, quite a bit of gravity to it when it comes to helping you or uh, anyone to understand uh by almost way of deconstruction, what, what we're, what our propensities are, what we're uh, compelled to do sometimes when we're in certain situations and we're in defensive mode or we're pissed or whatever. So let's maybe, t if you want to give us a, a definition of holding the calm as it relates to um, maybe not the multi-aspectuality, but just maybe in general. Sure, sure. First of all, I love multi-aspectuality. I'm not even sure how I would spell that. Uh, uh, thank yeah. God for spell check these days. Um, 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 I got to warm up for that you, one. You like, no, you like words and I love words. That's well done. <laughs> so what's interesting, and I'll, I'll give the long answer and the short answer on this, is that um, never in the history of calming down has anyone ever calmed down by being told, calm down. <laughs> Never. It just makes it absolutely worse. Yeah. So the interesting question is police officers and sophisticated folks who are in conflict know that. But the reason is why? Why doesn't it work? You know, don't tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with it. It's because we have an amygdala. And mm -hmm. I talk about this in the book, just a little bit of neuroscience, two kidney shaped little organs deep in the back by the brainstem. And that's the fear and negativity center of the brain. And so what that is, is Man, in a nanosecond, friend or foe, food or snake, you know, what do I have to do? And we do that through our own filters. And it's very intense. And what tends to happen is someone's upset. And what do we do? Let me just give you more data, more facts, more information, show you where you're wrong, explain why I'm right, and that'll make you calm down. And I'm hoping our listeners are laughing at that. And then the question is why? It's because when the amygdala is triggered, this fear negativity center in the brain, neuroscientists have shown that every one of us, I don't care your age, your ethnicity, your gender, your height, your weight, your socioeconomic class, I don't care. You go into what's called a refractory state mm -hmm. and it lasts approximately 20 minutes. So why would you give data to somebody when the prefrontal cortex, which is right here underneath your forehead, has shut down? Mm -hmm. All that's going to do is make you angrier and more upset and feeling more powerless. So the trick is, is that when someone's angry and upset, what they're saying is, I feel powerless. I feel out of control because you're trying to make me do something or you won't do what I want you to do. And I have fear and anger and disappointment and unmet expectations and ego and all that junk rolled up into one. The trick is literally is to just step back and find some way to give them some power. Mm -hmm. Do you like this radio station? What do you want to eat? Do you want to sit down now? Mm -hmm. Do you want to take a break? How would you like to handle this? Anything that gives them power lets the amygdala go, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Then you can shorten the refractory state to maybe let's say 12 or 14 minutes. Then you start can start talking about other perspectives or, you know, you may not have this information. Would it be helpful to if I gave that to you? That kind of stuff. That is just so simple. And so the real secret to holding the calm is being able to diagnose. Mm -hmm. So it's like there's a bomb in the town square and that guy waddles out in his Michelin suit. He didn't just start cutting stuff. He looks, diagnoses. What is it? Is it a pressure switch, a chemical switch, a remote switch? What do I have? Mm -hmm. That's what happens when your amygdala is not triggered. When you have a professional or you're just a third party in a family or in a workplace and you want to intervene to stop 
a train wreck from happening. Okay. That's one form of holding the calm, is being able to see that the other people's amygdalas have been triggered. They are in a refractory state. They're not thinking clearly or logically at all. So what can you do to hold the calm, to hold that space where some power can happen, things can calm down a little bit, the amygdala is not triggered. That's half of it. The other half of it is what if it's you? My amygdala is triggered. Mm -hmm. Well, my I'm, I'm in a refractory state. I mean, I've been doing this a lot and I'm a professional and you poke me hard enough. I'm tired, I'm hangry, I'm whatever. You could poke me too. I just have a really long wick on it. And so holding the calm is like a mantra or mm -hmm. a rabbit's foot or a talisman where literally if you say to yourself, and what I usually do if I can, I close my eyes because it lets me go inside. But if you can't, because you're in a meeting, you just say, I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. I'm holding the calm. What did that take? Two seconds. Mm -hmm. And what it says to your amygdala is, I'm in charge. I'm in power. I don't like what's happening here. Mm -hmm. I've got choices. I've got options. I've got tools. What am I going to do? Now you come from a place of power and not powerlessness. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden the amygdala comes down. I can see options. I can see choices. I've got some more ability to do things. So that's where holding the calm comes from is you can do it for yourself or you can do it for someone else. So instead of, I mean, if, if you're in a work group and everybody has read the book, now you've got a common lexicon mm -hmm. and people get upset and you can say, would it help if I held the calm with you? Who is going to say no to that? Yeah. No, oh, I got it. I like to rampage. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so it just gives you this ability. And that's just a few tiny little simple things. Imagine if you're able, there's 20 tools in the book. One chapter has a tool in it, lots of stories, lots of anecdotes. And what I also tell people is take my stories, take them. You know, they're battle tested. I've used them. I know they work. And why does the Bible or the Book of Mormon, or the Bhagavad Gita, teaching stories. Because it's very easy for me to go, Justin, da -de 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 or Justin, that reminds me of a story. Mm -hmm. Which one are you listening to more? Mm -hmm. Now I can tell a story that illustrates the point yeah. that you can go, oh, I see what you're saying there, and interpret it yourself. Way more effective, way more yeah. effective. No, that makes perfect sense because when you think about it, language and speech is justification. Language and speech is uh, metaphor. I mean, everything is metaphor. And so to do a compound metaphor of a a parable or a didact or something like that is, yeah, I mean, we relate immediately because it's woven much deeper than coming at it with some sort of uh, Mr. Spock kind of you know analytical, indeed. I'm going to give indeed. you propositional schooling here. <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Let, let me give everybody a quick story that's <laughs> not in the book. So it's sort okay. of a little oh, bonus okay. that I heard after the book was already, you know, in, in, in print. Yes, please. When the publisher gives you a line and says, no more changes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're done at that point. Here's your opportunity. <laughs> yeah, you're done. <laughs> But I heard this on Hidden Brain, and I just thought it was so brilliant. Um, there's a story of a couch company, expensive furniture. They would sell bespoke, customized couches for twenty dollars and $30,000 per couch. Wow. You can pick the fabric and the piping and the edges so. and the size and all that kind of junk, right? And they would get a lot of people that would go through the design process, click, 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 click. And at the end, they wouldn't complete the sale. Hmm. Why? It didn't make any sense. So what happens in our brains when we're pre presented with a problem is it's like a car, gas or brake. And so either you hit the gas or you hit the brake. Almost all of us hit the gas. It's just a natural thing to go, let me tell you more. Let me persuade you more. Let me speak louder. This company did sales. They did promotion. They did advertising. Didn't change it at all. Mm. So finally, they did what they should have done at the beginning, which is by holding the calm, is diagnose. So they hired somebody to contact the people that had gone to the point of sale and hadn't completed. You know, we saw that you spent a lot of time designing something. Do you mind if I ask what prevented you from, you know, from buying the sale? The overwhelming answer across every kind of person, these are people that could afford a $20,000 couch. They didn't know what to do with the old couch. <laughs> That's interesting. So isn't the solution obvious <clears throat> When you buy the new one, 
we take away your old one and we'll donate it for you and get you a tax receipt. There you go. I mean, easy solution, but because no one put the brakes on to try to diagnose and figure out what was going on, mm. very often we're very energetic, but we're solving the wrong problem and we're actually making things worse. Yeah. And so a big, huge part of holding the calm, I mean, everybody knows to be a good communicator, to be a good negotiator, to have good relationship skills, to have good EQ, emotional IQ, you have to be quiet, you have to listen. I mean, we all know all that stuff mm -hmm. and we don't do it. Why don't we do it? Because you're presented with something and then boom, gas off to the races. Mm -hmm. So holding the calm is something that you do to let you step back, create a moat around you and the other person we can think, we can see, because when the amygdala is triggered or when you're uptight or upset, we get what's called ocular occlusion and auditory exclusion, mm -hmm. which is basically your ears close and, and you get tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. And so like when I do a training, I have people put their hands like this around their eyes. It's tunnel, but you cannot see. I mean, you, you literally cannot see other options. So by holding the calm, my amygdala is not triggered. I'm not feeling powerless. You don't have tunnel vision anymore. Mm -hmm. You don't have auditory exclusion. You can actually hear more. You can actually listen more. Somebody hears what you have to say. Maybe they repeat it back to you using something called reflective feedback or mirroring. I have a little trick on that too, to just, and I, I know there's a long winded answer, so I'll be quick here. No, no, um, keep going, keep going, it's fine. <laughs> um, you know, reflective feedback is a marvelous technique, but it requires me to listen to you ramble for like 15 minutes and then say it back to you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a professional. I do this all day long, so I can do it, but it's hard to do for most people. And for some people, they'll feel patronized by it. Mm -hmm. Like I just told you, why do I need to listen to what you had to say? So a trick is to say the last three or four words that the person said. So you could ramble for 15 minutes and that's why I sold the cat. And that's why you sold the cat. Mm -hmm. You get 90% of the value of a full reflective feedback just by doing the last three or four words. You're nodding. And then just that last little bit. And people will just say, Hasha, you just get me. They won't say, oh my, you're a good listener and you're doing great reflective feedback. Yes. They'll just say, I felt heard. You get it. Mm. I'll do stuff like that. That's what holding the calm is all about. It's a very powerful, powerful way to be in the world. For sure. And that speaks to the persuasiveness without, it's a sort of passive persuasiveness or a non-intervening um, persuasiveness, if that makes any sense at all. Like it's, it's, it's there for the other person, the interlocutor to take in if they want. It's not being foist upon them. And so to, to uh, share, reciprocate with what you just said, um, I think your book approaches, um, it, it's, it draws you in, in, in an interest sense, uh, based on two things you just said, and that one was speaking in, in metaphor or speaking symbolically, but as well, um, people love anecdotes, I believe, and mm -hmm. I do because I'm very easily distracted. So if I hear a personal interest story bubbling up in a, in a book, I'm like, oh, you know, and I'll follow that a little more closely. And it's like you just said a few minutes ago, it's, it's getting me invested, getting me interested because there's things going on that are triggering empathy or triggering um, connectedness with another person. Because, you know, if you have that capability to connect, I think that comes out of the book. Uh, it and even, It even works with a narcissist. And people it? feel, it's so interesting in every divorce, the people call each other narcissists on the other side. Mm. I mean, it's just, it's just the nature of the beast, but it's not. Mm -hmm. They're just wounded. And when you're wounded and when you're hurt, you circle the wagons. Right. And I have a joke in the book that I call that I didn't invent, uh, but it's called uh, WIIFM. Everyone listens to that radio station. What's in it for me? Mm. And you've got some people that want to be kind and giving and loving and help everyone and all of that. Mm -hmm. but the vast majority of people are like, I don't have time. I'm busy. Who the heck are you? What am I getting out of this? Why should I care? Why should I be involved? Oh, it's too much bother and trouble. Mm -hmm. yeah. All that stuff. And so in every deal and in every problem solving, that is the number one barrier to getting someone to vote. You know, I just heard of a, a neuroscientist was talking about trying to get people to vote. And if you say, would you vote? You get a certain compliance. If you say, would you be a voter? Mm. It doubles. 
why should make any difference? Mm. Would you vote is an act. Would you be a voter is, yeah. I'm a voter. <laughs> and why should it make any difference at all? It does. You know, my, my favorite story on that is bananas, 25 cents each. How many would you buy? I don't know. I like bananas. I bet a couple. Bananas, four for a dollar, 35% boost in sales. Mm. Makes no sense at all. You'll throw those bananas away because you didn't use them. <laughs> Yet it becomes this, I'm not going to let the other guy get my bananas. Mm. Especially if they go limit two, it boosts sales another 10%. So the human psychology is so interesting, but most of us aren't going to take the time to go get a PhD in psychology. You know, I'm a lawyer. Yeah. I've done my own therapy work. I've read, I can't even think of how many books I've read and seminars I've attended and things that, but I get a laboratory where I get mm -hmm. a chance to work with people. And I mean, I walk into a situation that says, you're the devil. And the other one goes, you're the antichrist. Like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I got this I, to start with. <laughs> and it starts like that. I, yeah. do, I do big deals now where someone will say, I want a billion dollars. And the other, the company will go, here's a hundred thousand, <laughs> go away. Yeah. I mean, you don't settle that with logic, reason, and rationale. Yeah. You settle it with understanding people and how people right. work and holding the calm. Yeah, absolutely. I want to share one of the anecdotes from the book. Oh, there's a couple that, like, in the early part of the book, and I shared one with my wife this morning that I thought was funny, and that was the cruise line salesman guy. And yeah. he's in the room with these people who had the means to take a world cruise for 25,000, 30,000, whatever it was. I think you didn't mention the price, but I'm imagining it's probably up there a little bit. And he came up with this clever idea. I'll let you share the story because I can't do it justice. And and then I want to share another story, but it's not quite as funny as this one. But if, if you could share the cruise line story, I thought that was cute. I'll do it. It's good. So you have very wealthy people. And I'm thinking these, cru these cruises are probably 50 or 60,000. I mean, okay, these are, yeah. these are big cheap. things. <laughs> yeah. And people were not, you know, being real receptive. And so instead of trying to do the gas, push more, mm. get the break. And he pulled back. And by holding the calm, he looks at his group. They're all older people. And he says, you know, the reason you people have money is because you've been frugal all your life. You've restrained, you've resisted, you've been very careful with your money. You know, you have done a good job, which is why you have all this money. And if you don't want to take this, it's too expensive for you. I totally understand it. But I will tell you that we have a lot of daughter-in-laws who take these cruises with their inheritance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They beat a path to the door to sign up because that was the what's in it for me. Yeah. I'm not going to let my daughter-in-law yeah. take four, the cruise. Four bananas. Because, yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. And so now all of a sudden from it's too expensive, I don't know if I want to spend it, to oh, yes, I'm going to spend it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's the same deal. It's the yeah. same money, but it's the packaging and how it's done. But you can't do that until you hold the calm first. And I got to look at you. If you're gluten free, why would I shove pizza at you? Because mm -hmm. I like pizza because everyone else likes pizza. What's wrong with you that you're not eating pizza? If you're lactose intolerant, why am I shoving ice cream at you? Everyone else eats ice cream. First of all, it's rude and it's disrespectful and devaluing. So if you take just a minute and hold the calm, I have to see you, what's important to you. What's the your W-I-I-F-M? What's in it for me? What's that for you? Mm -hmm. What are the barriers to you? How are you looking at this? Do I talk to an introvert the same way I talk to an extrovert? Heck no. It's just those subtle things that make all the difference between uh, selling your bananas or not. <laughs> right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And big ups to the cruise line salesperson for hitting the break because it was just so such a clever play. Now, another another anecdote early in the book that I appreciated, and it's not as funny as the uh, cruise line uh, anecdote, but nonetheless important. And it was, I think, earlier in your career, you had signed up to do some um, volunteer time for a suicide or crisis uh, prevention hotline. And it taught you some valuable lessons. And it speaks to uh, something you were saying earlier about not necessarily hammering somebody over the head with logic and reason. And so if you want to share that anecdote, uh, that would be neat too, to give people a perspective on how we can grow and learn from sort of ham-handedly trying to hold the calm to being better and better at holding the calm. Indeed, indeed. 
So when I was practicing my own skill sets, um, I volunteered for both hospice and suicide crisis. And I did those probably over a decade, different, different ones of them, because when someone's dying in hospice, the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. So it's usually the thing with them, the family, there's a whole lot of dynamics that have to be dealt with there. And then the same thing with suicide crisis phone work. And I'm not a shrink, but you know, you can, you can, the reason I liked it is I wanted to do something and I'm busy, I'm working, I got kids, I don't have time. So, you know, you can go in once a month and do like a two hour shift mm -hmm. and be gone or once a week or once a month, whatever you want to do, feel like okay. you did some good and you can get out. And so I was already a lawyer and a mediator and I was younger and pretty cocky and arrogant. And they made me take this little two week training on communication. And it was kind of one oh one level communication stuff. So I just kind of, you know, sat there and thought of other things, did other things. So they gave me a class in listening and I'm, I probably didn't listen at all. Uh, but they didn't engage me to make me listen, which mm -hmm. is interesting. So all I want to do is get to the phones because I'm going to be great at this. I know it, right? So this one woman calls, one of my early calls, and her life is a hot mess. I spent like two hours on the phone with her, sorting it out, figuring it out, getting her resources, making a plan, getting her committed to the plan, inspiring her. I mean, I did all of that. And at the end, it's like, are you good to go? And she goes, yes, right? I hang up the phone. And this little old lady, you know, marches up to me and says, you're doing it all wrong. <laughs> I just said, what? Excuse <laughs> me? <laughs> what? Yeah. And she said, <laughs> what you did was show how smart you are. Mm. What you did was make a plan for her that just reinforced to her how incompetent she was to make her own plan. Mm. She's not going to follow through any of that. You just gave her two hours of attention. She's not going to change one doggone thing. She's not going to do one thing you said because you didn't empower her. Mm -hmm. You made it all about you. Okay. I it it stung, and I went home that night and thought, God, all right, I got to do this better. And so I listened. This woman's name was Esther. I listened to her, and I went back to the phones, much more humble and much more chastened. Hopefully, I did some good in better calls. But I didn't take over and take charge. I helped them come up with plans. I helped them see what it is that they could do. And sometimes someone doesn't want to change anything in their life at all, even though they've made nothing but bad decisions. They just want to be listened to and heard. And for go-getter people, that's so frustrating. It's just, there's, <laughs> there for anyone who's listening to this, there is a YouTube video called, It's All About the Nail. Mm. Just Google it on YouTube. It is hilarious. There's a woman who has a giant nail stuck in her forehead. And she's like, oh, I've got headaches. I hurt so bad. It just feels like so much tension. And her boyfriend, her husband is going, uh, I can fix that for you right now. Duh, you never listen to me. You don't listen to me. Well, but but there's a, no, I don't want to care. You know, and then it becomes this whole thing. It is until finally he just goes, Tell me about how badly your head hurts <laughs> <laughs> and just not fixing it. And it's so frustrating. Right. When you, if, if only you did this, then your life would be better or this would be better. It doesn't work. It should work. It's irritating that it doesn't work. I wish it would work. It doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's good sage. Good sage. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to carry that one with me that you may think you're you're doing right, but it's it's not doing right from where they're coming from, I guess. And I wrote a quote down or some uh, points that you had made. It was validate, understand, clarify, and summarize. And I think that fits in nicely with this story that you've just told us. Uh, it is. So, it is. Yeah. Validating is the WD-40 of life. You know, but you got to validate the person. I can't say, oh, that's a nice dress to somebody or mm -hmm. I like your hair. It has to be, you worked really hard on that project or... I'm really proud of you. You really stretched beyond where you were comfortable. Or um, I so admire your dedication. And in the book, I have tons of sentence stems. And what I tell people is to put them on a post-it note, mm -hmm. stick it on your desk by your phone, put it in a note on your phone so that in the moment, I mean, like I have them because I use them all day, every day in my laboratory, but have them so that pick two. Don't make, I have like a hundred in there. Just pick two and use them all the time. And then you're going to end up writing me an email on holdingthecom.com and say, 
hot darn, that worked. I'm shocked. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It's um, I like to give people something like you know, for the Thanksgiving or the Christmas dinner when you've got that nasty uncle, you know, or that mean sister in law who just wants to say little zetsy things to you. Yeah. And you you can't engage, but then you also can't sit there silent because then you're mad. It's like no, take the power back. So what I always say when someone says something tomfoolery, you know, or just really ridiculous. Uh, I look at them and I say, you know what I really admire about you? Everything stops. You could hear a pin drop. Who isn't going to stop? I want to hear the answer to that question. You know what I really admire about you? They pause. And then you can say anything. Your dedication, your persistence, your um, passion, your frustration, you know, um, how difficult things have been and you still persevere. I mean, you could say anything about almost anybody. And you know what that does to that person? Amygdala calms down. Mm. They start looking at you as not friend or foe, maybe friend. I don't know. Cause you don't know what's going on in their life. I mean, their yeah. shoes are too tight for God's sakes. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. they're dealing with God knows what, and it comes out just low skill set. But when you do something like that, it's a, first of all, it's the best way to shut them up. <laughs> it's the best way to have a chance of converting them into neutral, if not an ally. Mm -hmm. And it's the absolute best chance for you to keep your power so that you don't have your amygdala triggered and ruin your Thanksgiving dinner or the office meeting. You know, like let's say you're in a meeting and you came up with an idea and someone else took credit for it. People are so frustrated about that. Instead of going, you, you did this and that was mine and I came up with that idea a month ago. Now, you look at them and say, you know, John, what I really admire about you, everyone's going to freeze. You know a good idea when you see it. <laughs> yeah. Good. I know, remember when we talked about that and you made some very good comments about it. I'm so glad you're on board. Bing, 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 bing. Yeah. Yeah. What are they going to do with that? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's done with some grace and dignity. And what I tell people is, look, you know, I'm not a math person. I, I'm not going to go jump and take a calculus class. You know, I'd have to study for it and prep for it. So wherever you are is where you are. And mm -hmm. that's why the book is so beautiful and so easy. And I wrote it so easy and accessible because some things are really going to resonate with you and others aren't. But a year from now, it might. I mean, I had when I when I had drafts going to various lawyers and people that I know, you know, did they like it? Did they think, you know, was it valuable before I invested all this time and getting a book out there? I had this one friend that said, oh, that first story, the Teddy Roosevelt story in chapter mm. one, which I love. He goes, I love that story. That was the best. That was so that was the entire book. It was so great. And then I had somebody else go, oh, what does that mean? That's so stupid. You should take it out. Uh, I thought, how perfect. Yeah. How perfect. Yeah. Because I it, wanted this to be available for everybody, whatever your flavor is, whatever you want. Yeah. Some value there for the way you think and the way you work. Yeah, absolutely. And and your book is full of you take your choice. You know, there's things that are gonna something's gonna land with you and you're gonna take something away, you know, unless you're just bullheaded and you know. Don't read the book. Then. <laughs> don't read any book. <laughs> Not just. I don't book. know. If you hold the book and put it under your pillow at night, maybe yeah. you'll get some biosmosis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'll it'll <laughs> penetrate through some magical means. Um, and going back to multi aspectuality, I was thinking. Um, let's talk about you. You touched on it briefly, but I think in the book towards the middle end uh, or middle to end, um, you talk about understanding diversity and um, could go into the spectrum of people with disabilities, but it also talks about us being fingerprints and retina scans, you know, we're all different. And you as a mediator has to come into the room and relatively quickly, like you said earlier, are you an uh, introvert? Or are you an empath? Or are you a sociopath? Or, you know, who, who, who do I have at the table? And, and so that can, you know, in everyday life that can translate into making a, a bad situation not as bad if you understand, again, who you're getting involved with. So would you like to speak to that a little bit, the diversity aspect of it or expand it? We've touched on it a couple of sure. times. 
one of the things I know this diversity, equity, inclusion stuff is like, you know, the big deal today. Mm -hmm. And I always look at that and say, if you're dealing with people on their insides, you don't need that. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. glad we're doing it because our society needed to move a little bit more forward. But now you're getting people pushing and resisting against it. It's not really relevant because all white women do not think the same. Right. All black men do not think the same. All Hispanic women do not think the same. I mean, why would we say, oh, African-Americans are all this way? That's obnoxious. Stereotyping. And we're not. So if you're holding the calm and you look at somebody, I really have to see you. And, you know, one of the stories that I tell in the book that, you know, kind of shocked me because I think of myself as very open and I really try to pay attention to that. And I had a case, a disability access case against a big mm. fancy, fancy old hotel. Yeah. And uh, plaintiff I knew was in a wheelchair. Um, and I get there early. And I would just make sure the room's set up and everything. And he wheels in with, uh, I think it was three other you know, people, all in wheelchairs. And they, he just looks at me with an ugly, growling, mean face. And I thought, okay, this is a tactic. I can do this. So I just looked back. I mean, we, I can do silence. That's okay. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden he said to me, where are we supposed to sit? And I looked at him for a second, shocked. And then I turned and looked at the table and I thought, holy cow, it's a big, huge, expensive, fancy table in this law firm we were at with fancy leather chairs all around it. Where are they supposed to sit? Mm -hmm. I hadn't anticipated that and moved chairs away. And I immediately apologized, immediately pulled all the chairs away. But then I took the next step and I said, how often does this happen? And they said all the time, people just don't think, they don't understand. And then they blame us for having to get our own needs met. And we had a wonderful conversation about it. So then you know what I did when the other team marched in, because it was it was a very hot and intense case. The other team marched in and uh, I said, let me tell you a story. And I told them what happened. And I made myself you know, the holding the calm piece was that I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand it. And I think of myself as sensitive and understanding. And look what I did. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what it would be like to have to go to the bathroom in a gown or a tuxedo at an event at this fancy hotel and have to wheel all the way down to the nearest handicapped bathroom, which was way far away. So rather than a fight over how are we going to adapt it? And how much is it going to cost? And I don't want, that's not relevant. First, you got to get people aligned on the vision. Then implementation happens out of team building. And we worked it out. We worked out a whole plan. And I actually asked the uh, manager, I had asked the guy, uh, one of the lead plaintiff about this privately first. I said, would you ever let someone, if I could help you to a chair, sit in your wheelchair and feel what it feels like? Because I've, I've not been in a wheelchair wheeling myself around a conference room before. And he said, sure. So I asked the lead uh, manager, the actual client on the other side, if she'd like to do it. And she was brave and said, yeah, she couldn't negotiate that thing with anything. And she immediately all of a sudden went, oh. Mm. And it humanized it from, don't tell me what to do and what do I have to spend my money to, oh, I see. Mm. And it's so much more effective when you can do that. Otherwise, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. You're an idiot. No, you're an idiot. Boom. Yeah. And where's that getting us? We can look at that in politics today. Where's that getting us? Right. Sandbox logic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or not even logic, just sandbox. The sandbox. <laughs> yeah, the sandbox. And, you, and there's two good other good examples that are adjacent to what you were talking about. And that was the and I'll probably butcher the saying, it's bulwarism or or the, the manager uh, or, or the person that handled the union at, I forget which manufacturer, GE. 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 Yes, thank you. And there and was that, also, that, there's another example, but let's talk about that for a second. That the, one was yeah. really uh, in, very impactful to me. So there was a guy named Bulwar and he was the lead labor VP at GE. Oh gosh, 60s, I think. I think maybe or early 70s. And there were lots of labor disputes and lots of strife and lots of fighting. And so he decided, he's a very logical, mathematical guy. And he says, we're just not going to, this is ridiculous, all this fighting. I'm just going to sit down with my team. We're going to analyze the data. We're going to look at the numbers. We're going to come up with something fair. And we're going to say, that's it. 
We're not having strikes. We're not having fights. That's it. And that's what he did. And he would present it to the unions. And it was a colossal failure. They had more strife than they'd ever had before. And so those of us sort of in the biz looked at that and went, oh, that was a train wreck. That was completely foreseeable. And so I would ask our listeners, rather than me giving you the answer right away, why? We've done a little neuroscience here. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, Justin? Why did it fail? Well, I, I'll draw from another anecdote in the book, but it doesn't, tr it treats people like a commodity or a number and it doesn't address it. So in other words, you can't steal man your, your other person with that kind of logic. It's like, I hold control. My way is better. I'm the logic. I'm the logician, a logical person, logician. And to present that to someone else who is invested in their own interest, which is to have food and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all the things they want for showing up for work. That's that's part of that's what I took away from it. It's exactly right because what did it do? Everything I've been talking about with holding the calm is power and powerlessness. So let's say Bulwar was completely and totally right. Let's say that in every data point he actually leaned in favor of the union and made the data points much more beneficial to them than it otherwise would have. Still would have been a colossal, and it may have, he may have done that. Still mm -hmm. a colossal failure because what it says to the union guys is you're dumb. I'm smart. I'm just going to tell you how it is. Mm. And you're going to say, oh, thank you, wise one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you, great leader. We 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 gratefully, please, sir, can I have some yeah. more? Yeah, you know? no. we're not worthy. <laughs> no, it just, it's yeah. there. People will fight just to fight because don't you, don't you think I'm, I'm stupid? How dare you? Do, 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 do. And right. that's how the game goes. So good negotiators know you have to have throwaways. You got to ask for things that you know you don't want so that they can fight you and you can give in. Mm. You have to give people the ability to say no. No, I don't want that. No, I'm not going to accept that. That is un unacceptable to me. All right, I'll give in. Yeah. You have to have those things in any decent negotiation because the other side's got to walk away feeling like they want something too. Right. So you're, it's almost like you're punished for being too reasonable but if you're too reasonable, not in a smart way, mm. you're reasonable in a smart way. Yeah. And so what I tell people, especially because I do private negotiating for clients and things like that, is you focus on the war, not the battle. Mm. Battle is really incidental. It's the war. And sometimes you got to let somebody win a battle or two. That's all right. Yeah. But you focus on the war and what the goal is. But all of that comes from holding the calm, which is the ability to diagnose and see what do I have here? What do you want? What don't you want? Is what you're saying congruent with what I think you really want? And if it's not, maybe you're giving me throwaways. Yeah. Now I have some power, right? And in a deal, when you're this from a negotiating point of view, not mediation and conflict management, the person who wants the deal the most is the weakest. Mm. The person who wants the deal the least has the most power. And why? Because you can walk. You know, and you can sit back and you can diagnose and you can look. And I was once part of a very large negotiating team and all the big fancy people were talking and I was just sitting watching and I'm looking at the guy talking on the other side. I said, he's not the power. He's not the guy calling the shots. He's just the mouth. The guy calling the power was the quiet guy sitting next to him who was looking. And then he and I locked eyes and he knew I knew. And I, he, I knew that he knew mm -hmm. and the break, he and I went and had a conversation and we came up with a skeleton that he then went to his team and I went to my team. I got no glory. I got no ego. I don't care. I was there to do a job yeah. that can happen to, for other people. The idea was to get the goal, get the job done. So negotiating teams are use holding the calm if they're wise. Mm. It's not just data driven and shoving stuff at people. Now, this is incidental or, or kind of off uh, a little bit, but your book impacts people. You're doing what you do. People come to uh, mediate and they're savvy to your book. Would that make you feel really good <laughs> that people show up to a mediation and they're like, I read Hesha Abrams book and they don't maybe yes. know your face. <laughs> yeah, you start to pick up on that just yes. like you did, you know, with eye contact with the other. That would be funny, I guess, but you know, with that actually it, ha it happens. I mean, okay. I'd okay. say sometimes they'll say it to me just because they're sucking up to me. You know, I bought your book and it's like, <laughs> I'm so glad, you know, yeah. 
But if you buy the book and you know it, it's just a more sophisticated negotiation. I don't have to do basic stuff with you. There you, you go. Already know, you already know how to do stuff. I don't have to coach as much. Mm. It's a matter of, oh, you know how to handle that. I just have to set up the scene for you. Right. You know? Or in a negotiation with me, it's just easier because you know th this whole thing of win-win problem solving, it sounds great. And so, sometimes it actually works, mm -hmm. but you know, there's no win-win problem solving to the Super Bowl. You know, there are plenty of win-loss scenarios. So how do you do it? You know, how do you be good competitors? How do you salvage some level of win even when you lost? Yeah. How do you package it? What are the optics? How do you do that? How do you save face? Those are all huge considerations. And you bring that up in the book, you, the WOWD, uh, Walk Away with Dignity, and you, you reference the Civil War and General uh, U.S. Grant and uh, and um, not General Lee. What was the other guy from the South? Yeah, Gen uh, Jay General Davis? Lee. Was it Jefferson Davis? No, 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 General uh, General Lee. General Lee. Yeah, you mentioned that as an example of, of letting somebody take their Brilliant sword one. out of the battle, uh, which is a well, sign of respect, I guess. You know. And Well, we contrast that with uh, World War II. You yeah. Know, World War I, the Germans caused World War I, and it was bad. Yeah. And people just, France and England wanted to just crush Germany into the ground. Mm -hmm. And actually, I heard this, um, uh, there's a, gosh, I wish I could remember her name. She was on a a, uh, a podcast I listened to all about uh, confirmation bias and the small things that happen that have giant effects. And so one of the comments she made was that World War II happened because Woodrow Wilson, 20 years earlier, had the flu. Mm. You go, what's that about? And what happened after World War I, it was so vicious that France and Germany wanted to really punish Germany bad, right? Mm -hmm. Woodrow Wilson was wiser, but he also, we had an ocean between Europe and us. So yeah. you know, it was easier to be wiser. And he said, no, 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 you have to give them some way out with dignity. You have to be able to try to let them rebuild. And he was arguing for that. And then he got the flu. Mm -hmm. So he was out for a couple of days. And during the negotiation, France and Germany took France and uh, Britain took over, crushed Germany into the ground. And by the time the deal was done, the Treaty of Versailles, everyone signed it and it was done. It so, was so punishing and humiliating to the Germans that it took 15 years for the rise of Hitler. Mm -hmm. 15 years after World War I, Hitler was on the rise. Yeah. And that's what happens when you crush people down they don't just stay down and say, I'm dead. It's not like Rome and Carthage where I can salt your fields and burn your ships and yeah. enslave your women and children. Like, okay, that's, that's not a lot of work. <laughs> so, and I tell that to clients sometimes too, because they want to go for the kill. Hmm. And I will say, okay, you can, that's a strategy. But the question I have is, are you going to wound them or kill them dead? And they're always shocked when they look at me. Because we go through the analysis, you're not really going to kill them dead. I mean, this is in business talk. Yeah. Um, you know, you're not going to dis dismiss the case. Their patents aren't going to go away. The employees aren't going to stop file grievances. You may wound them. You may mm -hmm. harm their case, but you're not going to end it. So what are the repercussions three, four, and five steps from here? Yeah. You know, grand chess masters <clears throat> play chess eight moves ahead. Yeah. So let's play it out. You do this, they do this. I mean, and it's honestly incredibly predictable. If you do this, I'm going to do this. If you're going right. to do this, I'm going to do this. And it's in parity based on uh, weapons and power and energy and resources. And it's mm -hmm. completely predictable. So you play it out and then you just devise the end game strategy where, you know, that's a quote from J. Paul Getty, one of the richest men back in, you know, back in the industrial revolution days that his father told him, never try to make all the money in a deal. Let some of the other guys make some money or no one will want to do deals with you. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's true in negotiation. It's true. Leave, leave, leave a little fat on the bone, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't get too greedy, especially for, in a for long small term. town. Yeah. A small town. For kind long of thing. term and long term relationships and people move, you could still have a big win. Yeah. You know, but just that's all the holding the calm stuff. So anyway, I hope people like the book and that it is valuable to them. And if they're interested, they can go to my website, holdingthecalm.com. And that's calm as in C-A-L-M. And I've got a mailing list. I don't sell it. I don't do anything with it except once a month when I think of something cool, I send it out to folks. 
And I've got podcasts and one minute videos and all kinds of stuff on there that's free because right now training budgets are being cut. Mm -hmm. So take my stuff and use it for trainings in your organization or in your community group or in your large family or your book club. And then it just kind of spreads this idea out and makes everyone a little more harmonious, a little less acrimonious. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'll have um, information down below in the description field so that you can access uh, Heisha's, uh website and any uh, platforms, that me social media platforms that she might deem relevant. Um, and, you know, one interesting footnote to the Wilson story is he wanted to uh, form the World League or be part of the formation of the World League. And the co and Congress, the Congress shot it down. Because mm -hmm. it was too, he had something called the 14 points of light, which was absolutely Magnificent. Actually, I might be confusing that with George Bush Sr. 14 point. Well, he had the 14 yeah, Bush, point plan. Bush Sr. in his inaugural speech, I think in 89, I think he had that points of lights in his inaugural That's speech. That's right, I'm thinking of it. Yeah. But it, so it was, I think it was the word <clears throat> points. And the reason it failed is it was too good. Mm. It was too optimistic. It was too utopian. And human beings are not utopianists. That's why communism failed. I mean, what an interesting idea. Each according to his ability, each yeah, according to yeah. his needs. Looks good on paper. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? But yeah, yeah. anyone who still thinks like that, it doesn't work. Right. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Human beings don't think like that. They're not motivated that way. They don't act that way. It 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 doesn't work. So yeah. if you're going to do something, look at who you're talking to, look at who you're working with, and tailor something for them. I'm not going to feed you know, a bird, the same way I'm going to feed a giraffe. What do I got? Yeah. yeah. There was a quote towards the end of the book that I wanted to share. Uh, I'll read it and then you can expand on it if you want. And it was, uh, last name was Lucado and it says, conflict is inevitable, but combat is optional. And I think that speaks to leaving fat on the bone, but other, other, like you were saying, are you going in for the kill or do you just want to maim them? You want to, you know, shank them a little bit. You know, right. what are your options? What are you thinking here? And why? And, yeah. what, what is and one of the best questions you can ever ask, and I say this for people of teenagers, because teenagers are still learning, remember? Mm -hmm. And they don't listen to you, they watch you. So if a teenager says they want to do something, and rather than going, that's stupid, or that's wrong because, say to them, what outcome do you hope to achieve with that? Mm. Then they have to go, huh? What outcome do you hope to achieve with that? Then it forces them to pull back develop critical thinking skills. What, well, I guess that isn't going to get me what I want, is it? Mm. Mm, perhaps not. You can That's try. How you <laughs> That's how you teach them. That's how you show them. And that works if you're a manager and you've got employees. Try that trick. It's so good. Rather than telling somebody what to do, how to do, just, well, what outcome do you hope to achieve with that? Mm -hmm. You know, where, where's that going to land you six months from now? Yeah. What's the benefit of that to you? You ask those kind of questions and you will be shocked at either people don't rarely abandon a position and go, you know what? I just listened to you talk to me. You gave me more data and facts than I thought of. You're smarter than me. You're more analytical than me. You, you analyze this better. Thank you for explaining away my stupidity. When in the history of the world has that ever happened? Yeah. Ever. Point zero zero zero. Yeah. You know, and yet that's what we do. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. Look at I even find myself splaining sometimes. And I gotta pull myself back and go, Esther, suicide crisis phone line. Yeah. Let them figure it out for themselves. Right. Right. You know, as as oversaturated and cheesy as coaching can be sometimes, the the core of good coaching is that Socratic inquiry. It is to interrogate somebody, but you're holding this uh, debate or an, um, a dialectic with them and you're exchanging ideas, but it's all interrogative. It's all, and, and all of, of course I'm not, I should, I'm telling the audience more than, or myself more than I'm telling an attorney, you know this, but I like that about coaching is that you are rather than prescriptive, uh, you know, mm -hmm. kernels of information and wisdom or whatever, is that you're just drawing it out of them on their own. And um, just like it's the suicide. Different. Yeah. You know, um, I have a coach. I mean, she's marvelous. Her name is Sarah Caverhill, if anyone wants to Google her. And she's very good. You mm. know, she will draw it out 
And if I'm, you know, what am I going to do with this? And then she'll just ask seemingly unrelated questions. And then all of a sudden it all gets tied together and you say, oh, and that's because when you're mired in your own difficulty, you've got ocular occlusion, auditory exclusion, you yeah. don't see and you don't hear. And so why would I jump into the swimming pool fully clothed and complain that I can't swim? So there's times you're under stress, you're angry, you're under a deadline, you don't have skills, you don't have money, you don't have resources, you're pissed, you're whatever, you're not going to perform at your best. Mm -hmm. So what do you do to acknowledge that and then pull back, use the holding the comp techniques, use a coach, do something, read a book, all of that um, is just, it, again, it makes you feel powerful, which makes you in charge of your life because yeah. ultimately it's your life it doesn't matter what someone else does to you or gives you or is around or not around it's your life and in you know it, it's your journey so i joke butt naked and alone at the beginning you come in and butt naked and alone in the end you die mm -hmm. and in between it's your ride yeah so i'd like to do it more powerfully if i can indeed indeed um, I know we said we'd go about an hour on this and we're probably getting close to that. So I want maybe a couple things to put in before we we uh, call it a, a wrap. And the one thing that I liked at the end of the book that you talk about is um, when you're working with someone is to have a sandwich technique, mm -hmm. give them a little bit of good and then you drop maybe something not so good. And then you kind of, and this kind of flows with everything else that we've been talking about, but it, it, could you uh, share the sandwich technique too? Uh, as a, perhaps the last, there's one other question I have for you, but but. As a last um, yeah, bit of we, advice. We might have time for two. So okay, the good. technique I did not invent, of course. It's been around probably since the time of the Greeks. Mm -hmm. But most people do it poorly. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a friend in the military who wrote the foreword to the book. And he says they in the military, they call it a crap sandwich. Mm. It's usually an open face sandwich. Mm. Usually it's either the first part of the bread or the second part of the bread. And then you just get the dump. You got to have both pieces of bread. So you first have to open up someone's ears to hear them. And you got to give the information. And then afterwards, you have to validate their reaction to it. I know this wasn't the news that you wanted to hear. And I can only imagine how incredibly frustrating it is. Um, and I admire you for being so mature. How's that to get fired? Mm -hmm. Right? That's pretty incredible. Now, they may still be mad. They still, but they're not going to fly into a rage, you know, and maybe go take a gun to their workplace, right? So yeah. nowadays you got to be careful. People are medicated, they're unmedicated, they're on the edge and you don't know who is. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have a margin for error like we used to have. Yeah. And people can get pushed yeah. over the edge. So spreading a little kindness around, spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. How hard is that? Yeah. You know, It just yeah. requires you to stop, hold the calm, see you and deliver that information. And it's dramatically helpful. And in the book, I give sentence stems and things you can use that if you have to do this, you can look at it and say, okay, I'm gonna use these little tricks because yeah. it, it's helpful. Yeah. And it's fitting that you mentioned that people can be unhinged because you have a, a, a not a full blown chapter, but there's a segment of a chapter talking about the US Postal Service. And back, you know, those under 40 probably don't remember, but in the 80s, there were a lot of incidents of people going in with weapons and shooting up postal uh, facilities and things like we used to call it going, going postal. And there was some clever uh, sort of um, diffusion of that kind of tension. And there was a, you cited another incident like the bull, bull warism, where there was a manager who may not have done things correctly but yeah that technique uh seems to have staved that propensity not that we could do that in mass now for <laughs> like you said times are different but that worked in the postal service to mm -hmm. to help could, could you open that up a little bit with what she did because it um it seemed counterintuitive at the time yeah it's really amazing it's a uh, she's become a good friend of mine her name is cindy halberlin and she had read a book called the transformation of Medi uh, mediation uh the transform Oh, for goodness sakes, uh, the the transformation of mediation. Okay. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm messing that up. The promise of mediation. That's oh, what she okay. okay. And this was way back, you know, in the day, uh, early '80s, when mediation was just nascent and just getting started. Okay. And they the pro the concept of it was just a place to talk about feelings, and 
people, including me at the time, said, that's stupid. How are you accomplishing anything? These are labor disputes. These are employment problems. These are real life conflicts with differences of opinion. You're not signing an agreement. You're not getting to a goal. You're not solving the problem. This is just stupid. But what she did is she didn't bite off more than she could chew. She realized you can't get everybody, you can't do utopian. You can't make it everything you want. So what can you get? What is the hand you're dealt? Mm -hmm. What can you get? So all she did was train lots and lots of uh, volunteer mediators and some mediators that got paid like a hundred bucks, you know, to do this because it's good practice for them and a little bit of money. Okay. And they would meet with people and just off gas. That's basically all they're doing. And what was interesting, like 75% of the cases settled anyway mm. on their own, just because there was the off gassing. And then, you know, the story I talk about in the book is there was a supervisor who had way too many people to supervise. And he was frustrated and stressed out. So rather than, you know, so to be very efficient, because he was a very left brain guy, he just numbered his employees and he'd go number 10, you know, number 27. He thought it was funny and that it was camaraderie. Well, one of the guys said, I am not a number. I'm a deacon in my church. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. I'm a brother. I am not a number. Mm -hmm. And he got, they just bristled. And it wasn't until they started talking that the supervisor realized he had been shoving pizza at somebody who's gluten-free yeah. or shoving ice cream at somebody, you know, who's lactose intolerant. And he changed what he did. And the other guy felt, the employee felt heard and validated and valued because his opinion mattered. And it's hard to do when I listen to you and your opinion's stupid. It's very hard to listen because you're just stupid. Mm -hmm. Either I'm going to try to explain away why you're so stupid, or I'm just going to write you off because there's no fixing you. You're just too stupid. <laughs> well, what's the toxicity in that relationship? Mm -hmm. Even if you are right, even if you're right, yeah. what's the toxicity in that thing? Yeah. Not healthy. It's not good. And it will erupt in ugly ways, ugly yeah. ways. Yeah. It doesn't make the stupid person go away. Right. You still got to deal with them. Yeah. And sometimes <laughs> the stupid person has more power than you do. Right. And right. it's like that you got to really deal with it. Or, you know, a three-year-old clinging to your leg, screaming and yelling in the grocery store, all of a sudden has a lot of power. Yeah. Yeah. And you reference so you that in a a Belgian ad in your book. Yeah. Isn't that funny? The, the ad. Yeah. I won't spoil that one. We'll let yeah, the, that was good. You read, read the book, everybody, because it's yeah, hilarious. It's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> and there was also, this brings to mind um, the numbers guy uh, that you had a, um, I think it was a, a firing case, a dismissal case at a company. And the woman was kind of, it was like a wrongful dismissal. I'm probably not going to do it justice, but it was just a matter of like two grand. And you, you turned uh, lemons into lemonade and told this lady, what if the company said that, you know, and I'll let you finish that one. Cause that's a good, that's a good anecdote. It's a very good story. You know, if somebody, this is back in the day, I've been doing this 40 years, right? I was back in the day where the budget to settle was $2,000 and she, there really wasn't a legal liability there, but she was really mad to give someone $2,000 is insulting. <laughs> But at the time, a Princess Caribbean cruise for four days or seven days, whatever it was, was $2,000. Mm -hmm. You can say to somebody, I can't get you any money, but the company wants to send you and your husband on a Caribbean cruise to thank you for your service. That's four bananas for a dollar, my friend. Yeah, yeah. It certainly, certainly sugarcoats it, doesn't it? <laughs> Instead of, that's like the Seinfeld episode where Jerry gave uh elaine like 41 dollars or something like that for her birthday because <laughs> george costanza thought it was a good idea and she's a woman <laughs> she's, what are you giving me 41 dollars for same kind of thing not not that i'm alluding to women thinking this way but it's just the idea that she would just try to buy somebody off <laughs> let exactly alone for right. their birthday right yeah so that exactly makes right. that sugar that makes that pill go down a lot easier because they can go have a fun experience and 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 uh good memories of having been terminated <laughs> <laughs> now I want to ask you uh the at the end of the book you invite people to share uh some stories mm -hmm. uh for using the techniques that you give and the sentence stems or the word stems what have you gotten to, uh if you got uh, you must have gotten something interesting from those oh we've, we've gotten a bunch of really good ones I've had people oh, I had a feeling that the book has changed their lives <laughs> which mm. is 
incredibly gratifying for me. Um, and I've had people say they finally understood it because I wrote it in a very easy and accessible way. I didn't write it, you know, I got a PhD, look how smart I am, you know, mm-hmm. kind of a way. It's, I want people to use this. You know, I like that we're cavemen and cave women shoving food in our mouths. Here's a knife, here's a fork, here's chopsticks. Mm-hmm. Here's something, you know, you can make your life better. So I'm collecting them. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with them yet. Maybe mm-hmm. at some point we'll do a, I don't know, newsletter or something. I don't know, because it's, it's, interesting but sometimes people just want to share that it was really impactful for them and Mm -hmm. why it was impactful and Mm -hmm. i feel very gratified you know to uh have been a part of their journey yeah because i learned something i'm a big believer if you want to stay in flow it's got to come into you you got to give it out come into you you got to give it out you know i like that yeah yeah you can't bottle it up can't bottle that energy well, up. This has been a lot of fun, Justin. You have really asked me excellent questions uh, and uh, you're very insightful and I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate your book and I appreciate meeting you because again, um, I had some great take, as you can tell, I read the book and I, I had some great takeaways from it. And I'm gonna be sharing, I love sharing anecdotes with other people. They're little, little uh, I call it, you know, didacts, which is a kind of a weird word, but they're little like homilies or parables or whatever. And they're quick and and it just gets people thinking and it might alter their, their, the way they look at things. So I appreciate that, Heish. I appreciate uh, being able to uh, have a conversation with you and get some insight out onto a YouTube conversation. I think that'll help with people. And as I said earlier, everyone on YouTube, first of all, thank you for your attendance and for your uh, watching this conversation uh, with Heisha and myself. But like I said, everything uh, that you need to find Heisha will be down in the um, uh, field below the description field. So uh, Heisha, I'll say goodbye to you after we're done recording and to the YouTube folks. Once again, thank you. Appreciate your, uh, appreciate your being with us. So take care. Pleasure.